Welcome everybody to this latest edition of Say the Sounds webinar series. These are lunchtime webinars uh, meant to sort of give you a look at our work and a deeper sense of what we do and how we do it and why it's important. And today uh, we have a great one from Alex Crofta, who is our Ecological Restoration Projects Manager here. Uh, he's titled this A Way Home, Restoring Fish Passage and Healing Ecosystems. And he's gonna be diving into a bit of our work around um, fish passage and the many different forms that can take, um, some that we may be more familiar with and some that we may be less familiar with. For those of you who are less familiar with Save the Sound as a whole, we're a nonprofit organization leading environmental action in the Long Island Sound region. We do that by fighting climate change, protecting Long Island Sound and its rivers, preserving and protecting endangered or threatened lands, and working with nature to heal ecosystems for the benefit of nature and humans. And that is the program that I'm a part of. My name is Anthony Allen. I am the Ecological Communication Specialist Save the Sound. I work very closely with Alex uh, on this project that you see in the, in the image here and so many others uh, as part of our Ecological Restoration team. So uh, without further ado, Alex Crofta, go ahead and take it away for us. Thanks, Anthony uh, and the comms team for setting this up. Happy to be sharing this work uh, with all of you. And thanks everyone who jumped on today to learn about our fish passage projects. So <clears throat> just a quick intro. Our fish passage projects are in response to unnatural barriers to fish migration through rivers and streams. The most obvious example of a fish passage barrier is a dam. We often think of like very large dams. That's our picture in our mind, the Hoover Dam, another really big dam. But in on our landscape, which is post-industrial here in New England, there are so many dams spread across the landscape. Um, they were a source of power for a long time. Many of these dams are so small and overgrown and just, they're just ubiquitous. So we don't even really uh, we kind of overlook them as passages to, we, we overlook them as unnatural features on our landscape. Many ponds in the center of centers of towns or they're just, they're, they're, they're kind of just everywhere and they can be overlooked. So there's a, an example of a really small dam that we're working on in New London. That's about two feet tall. It's very small, but it is uh, even at that small height of that uh, barrier to fish passage. Another really common and really overlooked barrier to fish migration are road stream crossings or culverts um, or even some bridges. So you can see in this picture in the center of the screen, no fish is gonna be able to jump or no fish is gonna be able to get into and through that culvert. Um, really little fish wouldn't be able to jump into that, um, jump over that lip. Um, and even once in that passage, the water's too shallow for any fish to really swim through that. So you can imagine any number of configurations where there might be too much water, too little water, too much water. It might be too long of a culvert. So it can be either getting into the culvert or getting through the culvert that is an issue for fish or other aquatic organisms that may need to move um, from one side of that road to the other through that culvert. So that's a really common barrier that people don't often think about. And then there's any other type of obstruction that might be on the landscape. This is an old um, water main that was stretching across a river. We had removed a, a dam downstream and then found that this was still buried in, in the stream bed um, and was not allowing fish to move upstream or downstream uh, along past this barrier. It's an old water main. It was completely useless, um, decommissioned. So that was a removal project. And <clears throat> yeah, we're going to talk about basically getting over and around barriers um, as opposed to removing barriers in this presentation. So how do we get over and around barriers? Um, these fish passage structures are, can take a number of forms. Um, it's really site specific as to what type of passage structure needs to be constructed. So 
it depends on the height of the barrier that needs to be you know passed over uh, the flow rates or the space uh, the space adjacent to that barrier that's allowed um, that allows work to be done so if you're looking sort of across the top here you can see there's various types of fish passage structures there's what's kind of known as like a typical fish ladder uh, with an example below that's on obviously a very big dam um, there's a fish elevator which works a lot like a lock for ships um, that the fish swim in and then it kind of rises up uh, you know sort of filled with water and then lets the fish out uh, above the dam there's some more natural sort of solutions that mimic just a natural waterfall or cascade, you know, made of rocks uh, cemented in place. That's like a rock ramp or um, a rock ramp or nat nature like fishway. And then there's also, if there's enough space, as I was saying, sort of laterally along, along the uh, barrier, you can create what's, you know, this kind of uh, channel. So like kind of a secondary river alongside um, the barrier, uh, if there's enough space on the landscape to do that. And, the, and the, the photos below show what a number of these sort of look like um, with the really unnatural features, unnatural looking features on the far left and then a more natural looking feature, though still constructed on the far right. Um, another factor that goes into deciding what to build is the type of species you're, pass, you're trying to pass over that dam. And you can imagine that a salmon has a very different swimming ability than an alewife, uh, which is a small forage fish. An eel also has much a much different ability to pass over a structure than any of the than a, than a salmon or something else so it also depends on what species are in the ecosystem and what you're uh, building your fish passage structure for and i do want to make a note that barrier removal so complete removal of the barrier as i was addressing before is oftentimes or almost always the most ecologically beneficial solution when you're dealing with an unnatural barrier. So the ability to remove that barrier completely is ideal from that standpoint. There are many reasons why that's not always practical, um, be it hydroelectric power or cultural attachment to the dam or for some other reason it's just not feasible to do. So we are going to talk in a little more detail about full removal of barriers in a later presentation, but uh, we won't be talking much about that here. So what are the benefits of fish passage? Um, people, as I mentioned before, people often think of salmon. Uh, people know that salmon swim upstream from the, they spend their lives in the ocean and they swim upstream to spawn. Um, there are a lot of other fish that do that as well. Uh, alewife, blueback herring, shad, eel, sea lamprey and a number of brook trout or a number of trout uh, populations of trout will do that. All trout don't but some do. So those are species that are kind of less thought of but they're equally important. Um, just an example of that importance, alewife in New England are at a fraction of their previous run. So they're at 6.7, estimated at 6.7 percent of historic abundance. So and a big reason that that has occurred is, you know, dams and other barriers blocking their native spawning grounds um, in inland waters. So you can imagine the impact that that must have on the ecology of our landscape to have a population at 6.7% of its historic abundance. And the importance of this species in all of these um, small forage fish species is the, in the marine environment, everything eats them. So uh, predator fish that we think of like blueback or not blueback, but uh, bluefish or striped bass, um, birds like eagles or uh, osprey. Um, they also form a really important link between the aquatic environment. So the freshwater and the marine environment, the saltwater, by moving in large quantities, uh, nutrients and biomass between those two systems. So they're a really important ecosystem link and what's often known as a keystone species. So what we're trying to do with these fish passage projects is not just benefit these fish, but also benefit the ecosystem that relies on their movement between these two systems. Um, as an example, you know, there's this uh, fish being held here is an alewife uh, and this fish in this net is a lamprey, everyone's favorite fish. Um, 
And then in addition to the diagemous fish species that migrate between salt and freshwater are a number of coal are um, freshwater species and, and migration is really important to them too. Um, as well as reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates that move up and down rivers as part of their life cycle. Um, that's important just under normal conditions for these species to move around between different patches of habitat as part of their life cycle, but also in response to disturbance. Um, so there's natural disturbances, natural changes in the landscape um, that affect species and their need to, you know, move from a, an area that's become less habitable to a better area. So there's natural disturbances that do that as well as human induced and climate change. So as our landscape is changing due to those those factors, we're going to need to create more connectivity so species can move between suitable ha uh, patches of habitat and sustain their populations. So I'm going to segue now to our first project that we're going to talk about. This is the Pages Mill Pond Fishway on the Farm River in North Brantford, Connecticut. It's about a 300 year old dam. Um, this project was brought to our attention by a landowner who was seeing fish uh, jump into the dam uh, face and their uh, effort to move upstream. Um, so he got in contact with us and some other other folks, some other partners at Trout Unlimited, uh, the division of, or sorry, the division of fisheries with CT Deep. Um, and this also came on the heels of a project uh, conducted by the Regional Water Authority. So downstream, they created a small fishway that allowed fish to get, you know, from the Long Island Sound all the way to the base of this dam. And then above this dam is about four acres of pond habitat and six plus river miles um, upstream. That's, you know, habitat for these anadromous, or sorry, diagemous fish and other resident species. So the design of this project <clears throat> was based on the use of uh, what's called a Alaska steep pass. And that's an aluminum structure prefabricated. It's a chute with all of these baffles in it. And when the water goes down these baffles, it creates turbulence, um, little small eddies and other like hydraulic conditions that allow the fish to swim upstream. You can imagine if this was just a, a bare chute of aluminum, the water would just be rushing out of that thing and there'd be no ability for the fish to swim upstream through it. So that's sort of the the linchpin in this system and on this bottom diagram you can see the water below the dam and then there's two um, two angled sections and that's where that steep pass where that aluminum prefabricated aluminum chute is placed. There's the, a resting pool so a flat section in the middle um, in between those two passage, uh, in between those two slope sections, and then there's a long, flat, uh, basically flat section on top, and then the fish exit into the pond above. And you can see um, in the aerial view, it almost form it forms a switchback, like a road or a trail up a steep slope, um, with the fish kind of entering in the bottom there, and then swimming up, 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 and then around, and then out into the pond. So for a visual of that uh, before and after, there's the pond, uh, the dam, uh, obviously no passage happening there, no fish can swim up there. And then in place, there's the entrance structure below, the two slopes, the resting pool in the middle, and then the channel, the concrete channel out into the pond above. So the next project we're gonna talk about is the Neroten Rock Ramp Fishway. And this is, was conducted on the Neroten River in Darien and Stamford, Connecticut. This is <clears throat> a triple box culvert under Interstate 95. And obviously we're not gonna be removing that. Um, on top of, you can't see it here, it just look, looks like kind of some woods, but up there is 95. So there's no, there's no removing this. Um, with completion of this project, uh, 6.8 river miles were connected and our partners on this project were the Darien Land Trust, uh, NIFWIF, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Long Island Sound Study, and the Planet Fuel Charitable Fund. So those are folks that we worked with um, to get this project completed. And I always like talking about this design. I think it's really creative and in, involves some a number of different uh, measures to make this all happen in what's kind of a complicated complicated area. So 
Starting at the bottom right of your screen, there's the rock ramp entrance to the culvert. So that's a series of rocks that are placed into, and this is, uh, construction is underway. So they place these rocks in such a way that it forms step pools um, with, a, with a low lip between each one. So there are these rocks sort of piled in these into the, to form these pools and then anchored in place with concrete. So that's the entrance to, that's the entrance to the culvert. Um, water in this diagram, water is flowing um, from the from top to bottom. So the bottom of this, the bottom of the screen in the diagram is downstream, and that's where fish are entering. So they they swim up this rock ramp and into the culvert. Then within the culvert, these plastic baffles were placed. So these are sort of horizontal to flow as well as diagonal to flow. And what they do is they create, again, similar to that steep pass unit, a series of different hydraulic conditions that allow fish to more easily swim through that. Because if this was just full of water, it's just a concrete chute and water is just rushing through and there's really, it would be really tough for fish to get through that. So that creates a series of like resting areas where fish can, as needed, um, navigate up that in a much more easy way. And then at the very top of the, of a series of culverts. So again, this is three culverts. And in, sorry, I'm gonna go back for one second. You can see how shallow the water is coming out of that culvert under most conditions. Um, most, really no fish can swim through that really shallow water. So what this, this uh, upstream weir does is it channels, at, during low flow conditions, it channels all of the water into the one culvert that's passable. So that means fish can go up the rock ramp through the baffle, through the culvert full of baffles because there's enough water um, to get them up and through. This weir wall is low enough that under high flow conditions, water will go over it and then exit through these set two, these two culverts um, on the east side and in the center. So the culvert maintains high, the same hydraulic capacity, the same ability to pass water during those high flow times. So the culvert is really doing everything it needs to do. It's allowing fish to pass um, under low flows and then under high flows, it's passing enough water that the highway doesn't get washed away. So that's, um, that's good. And then here <clears throat> is the before and after. And you can see before, no fish are getting over that. And then after, you probably wouldn't even, I mean, I guess you can see the concrete in the foreground, but at a quick glance, you wouldn't even realize that this is a constructed feature. Um, it looks like a natural, um, a natural cascade or small waterfall. Uh, at the very foot there, it looks like kind of a steep drop. Um, this is also tidal, which is important to note. So water, at, you know, most at a lot of other times, the water here at this lower end of the of the rock ramp is higher up and fish have a much more easy time of getting up this rock ramp and then through the culvert. And then the last project we're going to talk about is the Long Pond um, proposed fishway. Um, and that's out in on Whitford Brook in Ledger, Connecticut. Long Pond is a natural lake which is augmented by a dam. So there's a series of dams at the southern end of this of this big lake um, that were built uh, for you know water power historically, and now the lake is a very important recreational resource. Uh, it's stocked with fish by the state. A lot of people fish there. There's a lot of homes that are built up along the, uh, along this lake. So it would, it's not really a candidate for full removal. On top of that, because it's so large and because it's so deep, it's 65 feet deep in some places. Um, it's like ideal, perfect habitat for spawning alewife. And they're based on, based on the amount of habitat within Long Pond and then upstream in another pond called Lantern Hill Pond, it's about 130 acres of lake habitat. And the state fisheries division, based on this, the quality of this habitat, believes that it could support an annual run of 250,000 or more alewife. Um, there's a number of other restoration projects that have been completed on this, on Whitford Brook in this watershed. There was a dam removal downstream 
there was a fishway installed upstream and then there's another fish passage project that's underway at the next barrier downstream of this site. So yeah, we have a proposal in. Um, we're working with the dam owner as well as a number of other area um, stakeholders that are engaged with this project and we're looking to get design funding to have this project designed. And awesome. That covers it for me. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Alex. That was that was wonderful. Um, and we do have a bunch of questions come through in the chat. So uh, we'll try and get to as many of these as possible here. Um, a couple of them are quick. How far from the sound is the Neroten River project? Um, not far. It's it's really it was the first barrier, I believe. Yeah, uh, let me let me get to that map. Yeah. There it is. So if you can see this map, if you can see my cursor, um, the red dot is where the fishway is. There's Holly Pond, which is a big sort of estuary. Um, and then outside of Holly Pond is the sound. So I think it's maybe a mile. Yeah, it's, it's pretty close. Um, all right, with respect to uh, pages, the Pages Mill Pond project, uh, I was asking why the decision was made for that one to build fish passage instead of doing a, a full removal. Right, so you can't, you can't see it in this frame, but right to the left of the edge of this photo is the owner's house. So it's essentially attached to the dam. Um, so that, I mean, that was one really good reason. Um, I think there might be some value in the pond above for fish habitat or for spawning alewife habitat. It, and also there just, there just wasn't interest on the part of the owner to remove the dam. Yeah, if you, uh, from another angle, you would see that <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's it's actually resting on the dam. It's, um, yeah. you know, the house, just, the, they get you know, like, vibrations and everything when the dam is, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite a unique situation um, and that, that home and that dam have been there for hundreds of years. Um, all right, uh, Laura, this is a good question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about bypass fishways, how close to a natural channel that ends up being? And uh, do stream bed species take up residence? Does the path change due to erosion? Does it help move sediment? All of those things. So you'd be talking about this on the far right here? Yeah. We, we haven't worked with this type of, type of solution. Um, I could look more into that. I think if you think about our landscape here in New England, which is highly developed, um, there's usually something really, really close to every dam um, in most cases. Um, I think that's probably why we don't see too much of that. Um, but it, I can I can look into that and find out more. I just don't know too much about that. But can you, Anthony? Can you repeat what the questions were about it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I can I can also, you know, we can take this offline um, to these questions. But um, you know, how close to a natural channel does that end up being? Do stream bed species take up residence? Does the path change due to erosion? And does it help move sediment? Yeah, I mean, I, I can see all of those things occurring. I can see it functioning pretty much as a natural channel. Um, it, these things are so site specific. Um, even the even the fish ladders, like the like we built at Pages, which is a pretty standard practice. There, there's so many different uh, site specific constraints. Um, and so like site specific conditions that dictate how these things actually play out. Um, but yeah, that's, those are good questions. I'd be curious to know how those bypass channels end up, end up functioning. Yeah, it'd be great to do one of those if we can, if we can figure that out and the, and the situation permits, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, one other thing I would say about that is <clears throat> if you think of how slope works, 
the higher the higher the dam, the longer you need to overcome that while keeping a, a height that's passable to fish. And again, that depends on the type of fish. So it may be that you need a really long bypass channel depending on how high how high the the structure is and also what your fish that you're building for can cross or yeah. pass it. That's a great point. Um, just a few, a few quick ones here, and then we got to sign off. It is 1230. Um, the seasons, the main seasons of migration for the species that were mentioned, uh, it, it typically starts in the, in the spring um, and, you know, sort of at different points runs through, you know, maybe midsummer. Um, so, you know, when we're tracking alewife, that run is pretty much done, yeah, at least in Connecticut at this point in the year. Um, and yes, we've, uh, with, with respect to recent dam removals, have you documented annual increases in fish migration? Yes, we track that. Uh, John Vanderwerf, our, our fish biologist, um, is monitoring at, at all the sites where we, at least where we have funding to monitor. Um, and the state does a lot of that too. And we actually saw an, a, a record this year for alewife at uh, Bride Brook, which is a culvert replacement project that we were part of back in 2009, 2010. And um, over 400,000 alewife came through that site this year. So we are seeing the restoration of these runs and it's really great. Um, All right, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, John will be presenting on our monitoring findings next a week from today. Is that right? Yes. Yep. So look out for that one. This is uh, sort of back to back. John is going to be doing a webinar just, just in the same format a week from today. So keep an eye out for that one. Register for that one. You'll learn more about that. All right. Uh, I wish we could get to all of the questions, but thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much, Alex Crofta. It's a great presentation. We appreciate you. If you want to support this work and directly support the work that Alex and John and the whole team does, uh, you can, and we would love you for it. <laughs> uh, you can donate at www.savethesound.org slash donate. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Thank you for your attention. And thank you again, Alex. And take care, everyone. <laughs>